A series of gruesome murders rocked the city of Lisbon between July of 1992 and March of 1993 in a span of eight months. The culprit behind such savagery has never been identified. Who exactly is the Lisbon Ripper and who were his victims? A case devoid of any resolution three decades later. Nicknamed by the police after the infamous Jack the Ripper, the Lisbon Ripper had a similar modus operandi to his British counterpart, targeting young vulnerable women who worked on the streets as prostitutes, trying to make ends meet. The first victim of the Lisbon Ripper was Maria Valentina Lopes, a 22-year-old woman affectionately nicknamed Tina since childhood. She was found deceased in a chemical storage shed on July 31st of 1992, lying completely naked in a pool of her own blood. A call had been placed to the police regarding her whereabouts. Who exactly made the call is still unknown. When the authorities arrived at the shed, it was the site of a very gory scene. Finding that Valentina was missing several of her internal organs, having been disemboweled. The brutality of the crime shocked even the police. The coroner who performed the autopsy on Valentina would state that she had been strangled to death before being eviscerated with a sharp object, possibly a scalpel, with the coroner then saying that her body looked as if a giant rodent had chewed it, with a large hole found on her abdomen, with 2.4 meters of her entrails being scattered at the scene. The medical examiner also revealed that in his 30 years of experience on the job, he had never encountered such a horrific case, and it would not be his last. The Lisbon Ripper would strike again, taking away the lives of two more women, who were also prostitutes suffering from drug addiction. It should also be pointed out that they were all brunettes named Maria. We can therefore ascertain that the murders were premeditated and fought out. It was also determined that at least two of the victims were infected with HIV at the time of their deaths. Throughout the rest of the year, anonymous calls and letters about the murders were received, all leading to dead ends however. Still, a connection between the killings was not established until January of 1993, when the corpse of another woman named Maria Fernanda Match, 24 years old, and a mother of two, was found dead in a shed by railway construction workers, with her head having been smashed in. It was later revealed that her corpse had also been eviscerated from the stern to her lower abdomen, and her breasts having also been cut off. Her torso exhibited signs of cuts near the heart and pelvic organs, including a laceration on her uterus. Her large intestine and colon could not be located. By this point, an entire police brigade was mobilized to investigate and find the perpetrator behind these barbaric acts. The final victim, Maria João Santos, 27 years old, was discovered behind a warehouse, who had also been strangled and eviscerated, found just 100 meters away from Valentina, the first victim. At the time, she had been living in the ghetto with her two cats. None of the victims had been robbed of their personal possessions nor were their faces ever mutilated, making identification possible. It was also believed that two other women also found dead around the same time period were victims of the Lisbon Ripper, although it was established that they were killed via gunshot wounds, differing from the killer's MO. Supposedly, a woman, who wished to remain anonymous, told a reporter that she had survived a deadly encounter with the Lisbon Ripper, only surviving thanks to the sudden appearance of a forest ranger, forcing the suspect to flee. She described her assailant as a white male between the ages of 28 to 35. According to her, the individual in question stopped his car, soliciting her services before she was sprayed, leaving her unconscious. It is said that these killings strengthened the bonds of cooperation between women working within the same profession worried that they could be the Ripper's next victims, going so far as writing down license plates and memorizing the faces of their clients. As a matter of fact, Maria Juan was a friend of Maria Valentina. The killer never left any prints or clues at any crime scene. The coroner 
suspected that the killer was a solitary individual with little to no relation between him and his victims, therefore being above suspicion, Juan de Souza, chief inspector of the homicide section, said in an interview 15 years later the peculiarity of Valentina's organs missing, something he had never witnessed before in a case. He regretted that not enough evidence could be collected to detain a suspect for long, and even if the crime had occurred at a later date, the fate of the case would have been the same. It was nearly impossible for a fruitful police investigation to take place. Although suspects were rounded up and interrogated, none of them proved to be the culprit the authorities were looking for, and they were all quickly released. It was speculated that the killer likely knocked his victims unconscious with strong blows to the head in the dead of night, which would explain the lack of any witnesses. He would then take them to secluded areas and perform the horrendous deeds of removing their organs, including their liver and lungs. The only connection between the victims was that they were all young women, sex workers with drug problems. The police would launch a series of theories as to why the killings occurred. The accepted theory is that the killer received an STD from one of the women, killing them for revenge until finding the woman that transmitted him the disease. By 1996, and with no new killings, it would briefly capture the attention of Interpol as a case study, but nothing came out of this. By 2002, a public body of the prosecutor's office, charged with investigating violent crime, would take over the case. In the years following the murders, similar killings had occurred in Belgium, the Czech Republic, Denmark, and Holland, leading many to believe that the Lisbon Ripper had gone international. Many suspected that the killer was a long-haul driver. Interest in the case also led to the FBI becoming involved, with free agents believing that there was a connection between the Lisbon Ripper and the New Bedford Highway killer, another individual whose identity has never been disclosed as well. Perhaps it was even the same maniac. After all, New Bedford, located in Massachusetts, is home to a significant number of people of Portuguese descent, although this hypothesis would eventually be dropped, mainly due to the fact that the victims of the Lisbon Ripper were mutilated, while victims from New Bedford were not. The investigation yielded no results for bereaving families still awaiting closure for their loved ones. In 2011, a man was arrested under suspicion for murder after his son made the claim that his father was the Lisbon Ripper. However, he wasn't arrested for these allegations, but for the possible murder of another woman in the year 2000. At the time of the murders, it was discovered that he was a construction worker who would hitchhike to Lisbon with friends. However, there was little evidence linking him to the killings or to the unrelated murder of a young woman in 2000, and he was released in 2013. Both his wife and son said that the story was merely a hoax, a cruel joke made by them. Even if the identity of the killer was unraveled, thus concluding this morbid mystery, they could not be charged, prosecuted, and tried for first-degree murder, as the crimes would have expired after 2008, under the present statute of limitations found within the Portuguese Penal Code. A confession is useless. This is a miscarriage of justice and a damning indictment of the many travesties plaguing modern Portugal. To this day, the culprit behind these savage killings has never been caught, and it seems unlikely that he will ever see the light of justice behind bars. The scars on the living will never heal. When reading about this case, I feel uneasy, repulsed, knowing that such violence could be and was inflicted on women living on hard times, trying to escape the hell they've submerged themselves into. When they cried for help, nobody came. I am left feeling disturbed, aware that at any point in time, we can fall victim to the horrors of violent mutilation and desecration of our corpses. The absolute disregard for human life and the opaque materialism pervading their lives. While we may never know the identity of the Lisbon Ripper, we can hypothesize that he was a methodical and intelligent individual, evading all suspicion from the authorities. In a previous video, I covered the homicide of João Chapolimau, whose killer, Manuel Lopes, was a war veteran, 
with many combatants that had served in Africa returning home with mental traumas that would not receive medical attention. Although there is no real evidence pinpointing the Lisbon Ripper as a war veteran, the violence inflicted upon his victims alongside the skill of disemboweling them could indicate that the killer perhaps had experience as a combat medic. Furthermore, their skill of evasion can be attributed to their experience of guerrilla combat, applying their war experience to deadly use on the streets and underworld of Lisbon. As previously mentioned, a woman did survive the Lisbon Ripper, who had already begun cutting into her when she was rescued. Although I don't wish to doubt her testimony, it should be noted that this information came to light two years after the killings had begun. The other victims received blows to their heads, but she did not. And as the coroner revealed beforehand, the victims were already dead before the evisceration of their corpses began. I also could not find any additional information regarding the survivor, and for all we know, this was a separate, malicious attack. But, this is mere conjecture on my part, working on the available information obtained from various sources and interviews. Regardless, justice may never be found for the victims, nor any final solace towards their families. It's on this mysterious note that I end the video here. Thank you all for watching, and until then, stay alive.